apologizes for being unable to be here. Uh, but the paper is important enough, and what Walter does is important enough that it was, uh, rather than leave him with a hole, uh, we've been here for over two decades, and I would say without any question, the uh, support we've gotten from Walter and a whole range of activities has made him an invaluable and uh, absolutely, was that the wrong word? Uh, an overly valuable, uh, important uh, resource for the university, and, uh, and we're very grateful. And so I'm here in part because I think they become, and I'm here in part to support uh, Walter. So her talk, is this working? It should be working. What do I do? This, there we go. So uh, her topic is on uh, looking at Japan and looking at the Olympics. And just a little framing. Um, if you think about the Olympics, the first Olympics in Japan was 1964, and it was at the launch of Japan entering the global era. The second Olympics in 2020 uh, can be viewed as a, an attempt to reassert itself in the global arena, in, in, you know, uh, covering a period of sort of decline and resurgence. Um, I was recently in Japan working with uh, some folks at the Institute for Social Theory and Dynamics, and one of the colleagues there pointed out a little side of a fact that I don't think Heidi knows, is that the last runner in the 1964 Olympics was, a, I think, a 19-year-old who comes into the city and who was born in Hiroshima in 1945. And it's very important to understand Japan in terms of the symbolism of these things. And that runner reflected how we are past the damage of Hiroshima and we are entering a new era. And here is a vibrant young man born in the year of the, of the bomb running into the Olympic Stadium. And what he said to me was that there was considerable expectation that the last runner coming into the 2020 Olympics will be someone who's born around the time or has been sort of uh, from Fukushima to demonstrate that they have passed that disaster and it's a new beginning. So symbolism is very important in Japan. And so a lot of what Heidi's doing with this paper is dealing with the symbolic nature of urban planning, urban design, and, and social um, processes. Now, I want to say up front, any mistakes that are made, I've made them. Anything that's really interesting it comes out of her talk. I'm also going to read much of what she has to say. Um, so if I stumble, it's because these are not my words. Um, so she says, the, re the representational spaces of Tokyo stake out its global status and stature, concretized uh, in the built environment of a victim, quote, the city is never a mute artifact of economic activity, end quote. Urban design for the Olympics is a specific instance of aspirational geopolitics projected on a world stage. Memories of the bird's nest uh, in, in um, uh, intricate interwoven steel lattice work lingering in the public's imagination, a uh, lingering in the public's imagination long after the closing of the um, uh, ceremonies, the synchronized ceremony and spectacle of fireworks that lit up the national stage in Beijing. Uh, my investigation of the 1964, my idea, uh, the 1964 and 2020 Olympics seeks to understand the art of creating and shaping the urban grid as a nation building project. Both out of necessity and by design, the Japanese state curated urban landscapes anchoring Tokyo as a, as a strategic engine and symbolic center of capitalist growth regime. Japan's Olympian aspirations focus attention on the nation's global design in Tokyo, unfolding in three main historical junctures. The first, against the backdrop of national defeat, humiliation, and eviscerated swaths of the city's landscape, the 1964 Tokyo Olympics paved the way for projecting national power through urban form, massive infrastructure, construction, jumpstart of the economy on the cusp of 1960s, showcasing modern Japan and the move joining the new liberal world order. Um, for those of you that have any uh, knowledge of Japan, one of the symbols of Japan is the Shikansen, which is the super fast trains. And they really came to the fore in that period to, to link Japan, you know, the cities in Japan. And it's still, if you've ever written on them, a, 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 a wonderful uh, marvel. I just saw another side that the Shikansen originally going so fast, a lot of mountains in Japan and entering tunnels compressed the air and resulting in a big sonic boom at the other end. And so to deal with that, the Japanese, again, by design, noticed that the kingfisher, as a bird, had this shape of a beak and a head that allowed it to cut through the water with low resistance, and hence, if you go to Japan now, the Shikansen pulls into the station with this very long, exaggerated nose, which looks a little strange, but it's designed to add the aerodynamics. But it was in response to community and, and civic concerns about the noises that were being made. 
The second period is the interregnum between the two Olympics, the two Olympiads. Neoliberal planning underwrote the curatorship of new theme districts for the urban renewal. And then the third, extracting memories lodged in iconic national stadiums and other heritage venues, the 2020 Olympics design recall the triumphs of the first Olympiad, tapping into current nostalgic yearning for a more optimistic time and appropriate symbolism and vernacular of cool Japan. A repurposed to rescue uh, Tokyo's global stature, battered and buffeted during the economic crisis of the lost decade from the 1990s to the present. Allusions to the late 1950s and early 1960s double for, historical, uh, for an historical chapter, a kind of prehistory of contemporary Tokyo, summoning a simpler time, cleaning skyscrapers, elevated highways, bullet trains, and other markers of, of global capitalist landscapes transforming the city. At the architectural hub radiates the movement design of the new national stadium on its original fo footprint. In other words, they're building the old, the new Olympic site on the original Olympic site. Um, the renovation of Tenso Tange's Serpentine New York Stadium, like a, a column set, what word she uses, bears ghostly traces of Tokyo's former economic prowess. So the, 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 the sort of the talk that I'm going to give on her behalf follows this sort of logic looking at the visual artifacts, which is basically what she's using for evidence, uh, nation building by design, Tokyo's ascent, Olympian specters, Olympian redesign, Olympian rivalries, and utopian dreams. <coughs> uh, the visual artifacts, so basically she's using newspaper stories that appear prior to each Olympiad, which sets the cultural and, and rhetorical frame. Um, official promotional documents to recover planning um, discourses gleaned from government agencies and actors. And then she spent site visits, uh, went to the former site and the new site to sort of uh, develop her ideas. So nation building by design, the research allies the field of urban design, typically focusing on shaping and aesthetics of the built environment, with contextual urban theory and political economy framing, quote, a number of societal developmental processes. Contextual urban theory challenges Eurocentric paradigms prominent in urban studies and urban design and seeks to understand complex trajectory of global cities in East Asia, and finally frames production spaces by stating capital interests in East Asia. Uh, a little footnote, uh, Heidi was part of an SSRC project and resulted in a special issue of critical sociology back in May of 2018, which does an analysis of a lot of the East Asian cities. It was held in, in uh, Seoul, and uh, there's an interesting um, special issue get a lot of, you know, Seoul, Tokyo, other, uh, Hong Kong, other cities. She says, while Tokyo fits Sasuke Sasson's statistical portrait of what makes a global city, operating as a noble command position in the critique, in, in the circuits of capital in the world economy, urban form takes its cue from national and international aesthetics and cartographical practices. <laughs> the literature recognizing translocal and transregional relationships in the language of flows has become the link from actual processes, material conditions, and geographies on the ground. In East Asia, the urban is as an important site in which, is an important site in which, quote, national development politics renders itself visible and in which the national state attempts to render population legible and governable. Um, I think the next slide. Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, the geopolitical ideas that uh, Connect, uh, about connections, routes, and convergences among places and regions have been distinguished theoretically informed contextual urban studies that deconstruct regional geographical representation. In the late 20th century, urban design valorizes art in the curation of the built environment aimed at the seduction of capital. Um, if you think about most cities in the West, the Lincoln Centers, the, the cultural centers, uh, lately if you read the New York Times, all this happening on Hudson Yards and, and the uh, and in fact, there was an article today about, uh, I can't remember what it was called, the shed, which was in fact on the site of the uh, bid to post the Olympics that New York City uh, tried to um, make a case for. So this is not new and it's not uh, ending. Curatorship of urban space announces a new, quote, faith in art, not only towards revitalization, but also by ranking districts. And you know, I'm always amazed when I go to New York, and even now in Detroit, seems to be a flag on every third corner announcing a new brand in the neighborhood as a way of, of, of defining spaces. 
she says, I define a curatorship as a set of cultural connoisseur practices and discourses anesthetizing urban landscapes ready for capital accumulation and consumption. Urban planners are keenly influenced by the premise and the promise of a creative city elevating, quote, art, redevelopment, and tourism to the holy trinity of urban revitalization. Competition among cities has played out in the Olympic urban design projects seeking to lure capital investments and tourists. Scholars studying the Olympics identify a central paradox of the Olympic Games. They reinforce nationalism and internationalism at the same time. These four designs of Olympic venues in East Asia host cities project a hybrid modernity, conjoining their cultural heritage and modernity, a synthesis between East and West. Tokyo's Olympic bid is put in the service of recuperating Imperial Japan, first rehabilitating an aggressive war image, and then recovering national euphoria captured by the original venues. Um, no, continue. Tokyo is a city of plasticity and fluidity, never finished, always in flux, in a permanent state of construction. Japan's 1964 Olympic dreams cleared the path ready urban space for its long-term development agenda. At the time, Tokyo's destiny as a global city seemed like a distant dream. The bid for the Olympics was central to its reconstruction efforts. From the outset, Olympic design dipped into the repository of urban memory, influencing the selection of official headquarters housing the Olympic Organizing Committee and the location of the Olympic venues. Taking up residence in the Akasaka Detached Palace, the Olympic Organizing Committee associated the 64 Games with its former occupant, the 1868 Japanese Meiji Emperor, credited with modernizing Japan. Prior to the Olympics, Tokyo assembled a, resembled a lunar landscape. Construction for the Olympics jump started urban renewal and enhanced the image of Tokyo and the nation of the world. The 64 Olympics modernized the symbolic representation of the city through major infrastructural projects in preparation for the opening ceremony. The bullet train hurtling across the island nation became an emblem of national pride in the work of shedding uh, vestiges of Japan's aggressive war, war image. Uh, another side, I'm making personal sides. Uh, building the train and building the new airport and arena resulted in major social conflicts with the farmers of the region and, and represented sort of a, a, a serious uh, cultural and social dysfunction in Japanese society and the ascendance of the state in, in maintaining or continuing the sort of post MacArthur a rule of the state over the people. Olympic design fostered a kind of historical amnesia to forget Japan's imperial past. Modes of memory in Japan, commingled expressions of modernity and modernism, instantiating, quote, Japan's place in modernity while, quote, simultaneously asserting her singular her singularity against the West. By hosting the 64 games, Tokyo consolidated its place in the single national political, economic, and media capital of the country and solidified its position as a global city. The neoliberal interregnum, which is the period between the two Olympics, um, sort of was from the, from the early 80s until the late 20th century, we scaled the built environment, we drafted the interscalar relationship between global cities and between central and local government, and aligned public funds to private capital development to brand to branded and themed landscapes. Cutting-edge global artists and designers were commissioned to replace the tattered soul of the old city with a new shrine of the modernity of the future. In one government area designated as a redevelopment district, Minoru Mori, a, a namesake of many private developments, fashioned the Punky Hills as a mixed commercial, cultural, residential complex akin to an upscale, upscale <coughs> vertical gradated city. Home to Tange's Olympic Yogi Stadium, the area came to define the aesthetic associated with cool Japan. If any of you have ever been to Japan and down to Rapunki Hills, there's an elevator in one of the buildings that goes up about 50 floors in what feels like a nanosecond. And you'd almost swear if someone said the building dropped and the elevator didn't rise, you'd believe it because there was no motion sensing the rapid increase. Very bizarre. Uh, Olympic infrastructural legacies retain their potent hold on Tokyo's topography and imagination. With the ceremony on the, with the economy on the skids, specters of Olympic glory and held Tokyo's bid to host the 2016 Olympics, faced with the ascent of other East Asian cities, if you remember Beijing got the Olympics, Tokyo's nationalist governor Shintiro Hashira hoped the Olympics would resuscitate the young economy and kickstart another economic boom. Um, the blueprint for the 2016 Olympics took a page from the original building plan 
Did a tribute to 64, the bid proposed curating the former site for the new national stadium would showcase the star Japanese architect, Tado Ando. And if any of you are familiar with Japanese architecture, he's well known for his sort of cement use. And there's an entire island in southern Japan in Naoshima that is a testament to his architectural brilliance. Um, whose reputation uh, mirrored Kenzo Tange, who built the original stadium. On a more modest scale than the 64 Olympics, this 2016 plan would refurbish existing facilities clusters in the heart of Tokyo and revitalize the waterfront area. <coughs> Despite losing the bid, the 2016 Olympic plan fueled another phase of redevelopment. The wrecking ball bulldozed cheap municipal housing in an exclusive enclave of Shibuya. Gentrification was seen as an antidote but could not dispel the growing national anxiety around Tokyo's falling global stature. This is, um, like its predecessor in 1964, the successful bid of the 2020 Olympics served as a platform for government in shaping Tokyo's representation, representational space. Um, the, the document, New Tokyo, New Tomorrow, the Action Plan for 2020, lays out a vision of Tokyo's future. Uh, it reveals an obsession with ranking among global cities. Tokyo's municipal government seeks to, quote, restore Tokyo to its position as Asia's number one financial center by declaring that we will promote bold measures to revitalize Tokyo brand, uh, the Tokyo brand, which mixes cultural, a cutting edge fintech, digital media, and the fashion and hand of, of traditional handicraft and agricultural products uh, harvested in, quote, unquote, in Tokyo. This is the design that uh, um, was uh, by um, Saha Hadid. Uh, when they first uh, thought about um, uh, designing the stadium, they landed uh, her, uh, her like, landing like a spaceship. Saha Hadid's winning design for the 2020 Olympics drew a program from Japanese architects who dropped the building as a monstrosity and a turtle waiting for Japan to sink. Japanese minister Shinzo Abe scrapped the original plan referring to Ava's Japanese architects, known for this for his use of natural materials in keeping with the Olympic sustainability of rhetoric. Kengo Kuma's wooden lattice design beat out Toyo Ito for the prestigious commission. The Japan Times reported that Japanese Japanese-ness was a key factor in this competition in addition to cost and time estimates. Japan Sports Council concurred with the email with an email statement that said we build we aim to build Japan's national stadium to boost the to, to boast of the world. Kuma's new stadium at the center represented the dual gestures towards national assertion and anxiety. For the 2020 Olympics, the Planning Commission created conceptual and symbolic topography dividing venues into a heritage zone. All right. um, the plan and reimagined heritage sites curated to preserve memories of 1964 producing a landscape of nostalgia. They bolstered the past against a future orientation state in the Tokyo Bay Zone. The venue plan sought to generate infinite excitement, quote unquote, visually mem memorializing the 64 Tokyo Olympics alongside the topography of an imagined eco-friendly um, structure. Uh, it, the incept from the inception, the green aesthetic principles espoused by the government and favored by the architect ran up against the realities of sourcing non-sustainable materials and questioning construction, questionable construction practices. An article in the Japan Times reported in an open, um, in an open letter uh, alleging illegal lobbying and human and labor rights violations linked to the harvesting of the, of the, uh, the timber for the stadium. Um, this is the new stadium that was being proposed by Kenzo Kuma that was approved and is being built. Uh, oddly, when Heidi was in Tokyo trying to get pictures and visit the site, it's highly restricted and she couldn't even approach the building. It's very, one would think it would be promoted and, 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 uh, and, and uh, it would be easy access, but she said she only managed to get a couple of pictures when the large gate opened to allow trucks to come in and she was able to snap a couple of pictures. Um, rival cities in the region now compete for prominence in the global economy, threatening Tokyo's position in the hierarchy of global cities. Tokyo's vulnerability is rooted in the connected histories of the region. Older global cities repurpose the built environment to accommodate shifting economic functions. Up and coming global cities in East Asia rely on new state directed development efforts to transform this built environment. Quick spatial fixes afforded by Olympic sized building projects offer instantaneous cosmopolitanism 
by hiring Star Tech, Star Techs, whose brand names and styles convey global prestige value, aspirational status, and the symbolic economy. Tokyo's bid in this architectural sweepstakes worked on a more confined footprint for repackaging heritage sites and the Tokyo Bay Zone. These buildings are modest in comparison to the monumental scale and gigantism of projects like the Bird's Nest. But part of the idea is that an older city like Tokyo, and most older cities are constrained by the existing built environment. Um, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, a colleague of mine was visiting Detroit and commented on how the three stadiums right downtown are the death knell to the city if it ever decides to come back because it basically carves out an inner space that prevents it from becoming sort of the new city, if you will. Um, the aura of Beijing 20, uh, 2008 Olympi Olympics cast a dark shadow over Tokyo, heightening Japan's rivalry visit in Japan by China. Japanese politicians reacted nostalgically to the glitzy spectacle overflowing from the Beijing Olympics, yearning for the golden years inaugurated by the 64 Olympics. New realities present the country wrestling with the contradiction of Olympic aspirations with a problem. How to brand Japan in a newly competitive Asian environment? Under conditions like those which make possible the success of cultural curatorship in Tokyo and its zenith are now appearing in Taipei, Seoul, Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Beijing. Tokyo's Olympian revelries are tempered by the reconfigured East Asian rivalries. Um, one of the symbols of the Olympics is this symbol of infinity, which is that figure eight on the side. And these are the two zones. Uh, the, the golden circle above is the built environment that they're expanding, and the, and the uh, lower circle is the design to redo the entire harbor area. Um, and uh, one of the things that's sort of interesting, at least to me, is that um, the old areas uh, represented garbage dumps and uh, discarded uh, parts of the city. And so this is sort of an attempt at and recasting in a space that otherwise is not available. It's very difficult to find new space. If you've been to Tokyo, it's, it's, it's multi-level as, as, as well as wide. You know, I discovered why faxes were invented. Everybody I saw in Tokyo comes out of a train station with a fax, a, a little map of instructions on how to get to the address. Because one, the numbering of streets of buildings in many of the older parts of the city is numbered in the order in which the building was built. So there's no logic you know, walking down the street, one, three, five, seven. And the second is that a lot of the places are on the third or fourth level. Um, and I, and this is true in China as well, when I, I was taken to very nice restaurants and they were invariably on the fifth floor, ninth floor, eighth floor malls. Uh, if you don't know the city, you don't know the city. I mean, not the sun. Um, this is a superimposition. If you can see over it, there's the new stadium, and you can see over it is the bird's nest um, that was imposed. And it's, you can sort of see the idea of trying to reflect and resurrect all the excitement of the bird's nest without any of the architectural um, brilliance. Um, I'm coming to an end, I believe, I think. I think I am. Postscript, good, that's a good sign. The 2020 Olympics has generated historical reckoning, reckoning through national design in Tokyo. One of the most astute commentaries sees imperial designs dressed up in cosmopolitan rhetoric. Guthrie Shimizu contextualizes the use of elite sports, quote unquote, quote, elite sports as a tool for showcasing national superiority and fostering national pride, which bears an eerie resemblance to the public discourse surrounding Japan's pre-war mode of engagement with the Olympic movement, end quote. The Tokyo can take a page from the IOC charter Shimizu suggests that the gesture to go, quote, a long way towards liquidating its imperial past. Japan would also be able to exercise enlightened leadership in transcending the East Asian model of Olympic hosting, one chain to geopolitical prestige, consumer modernity, and economic development. Japan's resurgent nationalism and militarism belie an optimistic look for post-imperial Tokyo. Um, landscapes are more likely to reflect nostalgia than alternative visions for the future of urban citizens. And with that, I think I'm done. Or she's um, If you have some questions, I might be able to answer them. If not, we can uh, email Heidi. I think I've got three that way ready. Any, any questions, comments that I can pass them on to her? Perfect. I, yeah. I, 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 yeah, please. I, I think you might, by virtue of your, your time there as well, be able to answer. I, 
I, the number of contradictions that she mentioned, uh, or, or paradoxes, nationalism, imperialism, internationalism, national assertion, anxiety, environmentalism versus pollution, corruption, consumption. Um, is, is there, they're trying to square a lot of circles. Absolutely. Is, is this something that's part of the sort of public discussion of the Olympics? Well, these tensions? Okay, two quick comments. Um, so, working with Japanese colleagues, one of the things you learn is when you ask the question, if they have a positive answer, they answer you. If they don't have a positive answer, they ignore you. Uh, it's rude to say no, so they don't answer. All right. um, why I raise that is I think that there's a sense of an interiorness that precludes any kind of public disagreement and public discussion. So there's a certain propriety that must be maintained. Uh, that doesn't keep um, sort of political discourse from emerging, but you tend to see it at the lower levels of society, working class people, poor people. Um, uh, I was told by a colleague who does work on homelessness that when you interview people in the US on homelessness, their mantra usually is, we did something wrong, we became alcoholics, we failed. If you talk to Japanese homeless people, often the mantra is, society failed us, um, our families failed us. It's a sense of obligation. Uh, there's incredible anxiety about the fact that it's an aging population. Um, and that's made more difficult by a very strict immigration policy that is only lately on there allowing certain people coming from certain places and mainly who are doing care work. So you have Filipino uh, the, the care workers coming into the country. Um, but I would say uh, you have to become, you have to get to know someone well and have to feel comfortable with you in private to be able to have these kinds of discussions. I don't see a whole lot other than the kind of things that he discovers in newspaper articles. Um, and often that's politically motivated, like an attack on one political party and political power by people who are out of power that don't attack the, the, uh, the, the symbols of the Olympics. So I hope that answers it to some extent. Yeah. I wonder if she had any reflection about the design of the official identities for the I will say yes. No, no, I know. And, and that, what's motivated, she's been going to Japan now for almost a decade. Uh, and, and most of her work has been on sort of social issues, care work, uh, labor, gender. And she had a grant, and I think Walter supported it at some point, where she brought working um, the union women from Japan to the US to meet union women in the US, and vice versa, brought them back to Japan to discuss. And they began to discuss the differences. So that's been the main focus of her research. But it's been, you know, I learned, so one more word I learned from Bruce Flaneur, right? Uh, the person who wanders the streets and observes the built environment in a cultural form. And she does that in Japan, she does that in Paris. So she's keenly aware, I'm going to put words in her mouth, but I would say she's keenly aware of the relationship between design, culture, and politics. And so I cannot help but think that this is part of her framing why this topic became important to her and she put the proposal. Any good? Another question? So multiple hands, now only one question. All right. Uh, feel free to contact her. I'm sure she's welcome your your comments. And this is much better than any talk I've given. Thanks very much. Dave.